Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and to the elders from other communities who may be here today. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Evan Newell. I met Evan at the uh, national, um, actually, what does NIF stand for? I don't know, the NIF Winter School for Immunology <laughs> in Singapore um, a couple of years ago. Um, so Evan completed his uh, bachelor's at McGill in physiology uh, and worked under the guidance of Dr. Leanne Schlichter. Um, he then moved to California for a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford with Mark Davis, whom many of you may know as a, a real pioneer in the, in the field of T cell biology, uh, where he initiated the use of mass cytometry for the study of antigen-specific cells using uh, heavy metal-labeled peptide uh, uh, markers. Uh, and I'm sure he'll explain a bit of that later. Um, but the thing I really like about Evan and the reason I've, uh, well, we've chosen to invite him to come here is that he's, he's one of the new breed, well, we've got Phil Hodgkin as a pioneer in this area, but one of the newer breeds of those who can mix wet lab and dry lab work together to try and get novel insights about a biology, in his particular case, it's immunology. And I'm sure you'll see some interesting approaches to trying to get at, you know, if we don't know ahead of time what we're looking for, how can we find some interesting biology underlying um, the data? So he's now a principal investigator at ASTAR Sign, the Sim Singapore Immunology Network, and he's been there four years um, with an adjunct professorship at the National University of Singapore and Nanyang Technical University. So thanks very much for taking the time out, Evan, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Awesome, thanks so much, Shalene, for this opportunity, and thanks for, for coming. I know it's been, a, it's been a long week, so you're all probably tired of hearing seminars, so I will, um, thanks again for, for coming to check this out. And the introduction was, was perfect. Um, so, yeah, as, as Shalene was referring to, um, we're, we're aware of the fact that immune cells are highly diverse in, in various human tissues, and in order to understand what they're doing in the context of disease, uh, we need to come up with better ways of focusing on the relevant cells. Um, and we're most, we mostly think about T cells, and, and in, in the case of T cells, you can do this by looking at um, activated T cells, um, presumably they'd be activated in, in, a, in the case of a disease um, where you have a T cell involvement. We can also look at trafficking, receptor expression profiles, or the location of the cells. Um, and then to, to be sure you're looking at um, relevant cells, we can look at antigen specificity. Um, and this is especially important in the blood where you have a lot of T cells that um, are probably irrelevant for whatever viral infection or it is you're looking at. So in order to focus on relevant ones, you should look at the antigen specific ones. So that's sort of one of the main drivers of, of what we've been trying to do. And then sort of combining all these um, measures together, um, we can take a broad and unbiased perspective of cellular composition and then try to look for interesting populations based on that. Um, and so my lab um, uses mass cytometry um, to analyze immune cells and we're also try to come up with um, other ways of using this data or, um, or developing ways of doing this. Um, and so in using this, we can analyze um, cellular phenotype in bulk, we call this, this would still be on single cells, but um, without taking into account um, antigen specificity. Um, or I'm also going to talk about um, the development of this multiplex tetramer analysis that we are using to screen for T cell epitopes um, and then to simultaneously analyze the phenotypes of those T cells. And so today I'm going to talk about sort of our analysis of cellular phenotypes on healthy versus disease um, blood and tissue in general. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the work we've, doing, we've been doing um, in the context of chronic HB, hepatitis B virus infection in humans. And that's looking um, so far just at blood samples. And then also um, our application of these methods to looking at um, cancer specific T cell responses and also just tumor infiltrates in general. And so the goal, the sort of overarching goal of this is to, um, in the case of 
um, the chronic HPV infection and cancer studies to try to understand um, some, get some insights about T cell um, dysfunction, um, and also to try to identify novel biomarkers for these diseases um, and potential therapeutic targets. In the case of the epitopes, um, this could also constitute um, um, therapeutic target discovery. Um, and so, look again, look talking about T cell diversity. Um, because T cells have this broad range of antigen specificity, um, this can dictate their, their subsequent um, responses to whatever it is they're specific for. And then therefore they have a very broad range of, of phenotypes and functional diversity. And so we can sort of categorize this diversity in terms of markers um, that are indicative of antigen experience or memory versus effector status. Um, it's also common to evaluate the functional capacity of different um, T cell populations with respect to the types of cytokines they can produce or killing capacity. There's also a number of interesting phenotypic markers that are indicative of dysfunction, such as exhaustion associated markers or senescence markers, um, trafficking receptors, chemokine receptors um, are, are very um, you know, heterogeneous in their expression profiles and indicative of where the cell is um, going to be migrating. And then lastly, just we can assess the abundance or recent proliferation of these cells. And so for all of these different things that you want to know about T cells, um, you can measure them um, with various um, markers by flow cytometry. So we're using flow cytometry to assess many different markers for each of these different categories, including the antigen specificity. And then we also want to know how all of these different markers are related to each other to learn about how antigen specificity dictates these things and how these various types of markers are um, related. And so to do that, we need a lot of different channels, and that's where the mass cytometry comes in. Um, as you were probably aware with fluorescence flow cytometry, there's a limitation in terms of the number of channels that you can use because of over a crosstalk between um, different fluorophores and their excitation and emission spectrum. Uh, this is improving quickly, um, um, but an alternate approach is to use um, atomic mass um, um, spectra instead, and so in this case, uh, we can label um, our tags, our antibodies, or peptide MHC tetramers with monoisotopic heavy metals, and then use time of flight mass spectrometry to um, to look at the, the these tags instead of fluorophores. And this allows us to do more than 40 different antibodies at the same time with very little crosstalk between the channels. And so with a 40 color flow cytometry experiment, we have a problem in that it's very hard to get a, a general picture of the cells that you can observe with 40 dimensions. And so one way to try to do this is to sort of have a, an idea of what you're looking for and then gate on populations using two markers at a time. And you can do this in nearly endless number of ways. Um, and so this is sort of prompted, I think going over a certain threshold in terms of a number of parameters has prompted um, a lot of um, investigation into better ways of doing this. Um, one very nice way is to use clustering algorithms um, that sort of make these nodes of different cell populations that have similar phenotypes. Um, the problem that I've had with these is that it's hard to have an intuitive understanding of why these different clusters are different from each other and really how segregate are these different clusters. And um, it, it, you have a hard time getting intuitive sense um, for the data this way. Um, and so instead, I've been interested in using dimensionality reduction methods where you take um, this high dimensional data and boil it down into, um, in this case, principal components. So using linear combinations of markers to try to best explain variation in the data, we used um, three dimensional PCA to, um, to plot the phenotypes of uh, human CD8 positive T cells from blood. And we get this characteristic pattern whereby there's a, a, a cluster of cells that have naive-like phenotype and they're 
mostly segregated from a large smear of, of cells that have antigen experienced phenotypes. And then we could describe um, in, in this plot along that smear, um, this continuum in terms of um, phenotypic marker expression profiles, and also in terms of cytokine production capacity profiles. And so this fit pretty nicely with what we already knew about T cell um, populations. Um, but and then allowed us to sort of describe this continuum. It wasn't very satisfying though, because we know that within these smears, there's a lot of um, heterogeneity, or it didn't it doesn't capture really the, the the large degree of heterogeneity that we could see in terms of different combinations of cytokines expressed or different combinations of other markers expressed. And so we were excited about this um, TSNE or T. -dis T distributed stochastic neighbor embedding version of, of dimensionality reduction, which is, allows for nonlinear relationships between markers and plot cells that are most similar, closest to each other. So it has fewer um, restrictions. And on the same data set, you can see um, that we can segregate um, a lot, um, we can see a much finer grain resolution of different um, T cell populations. And then based on this, we can either um, objectively or subjectively cluster cell populations and then look at what those populations represent in terms of the markers that they expressed. And then again, we can come up with, um, in this case, um, arbitrarily 19 different clusters of cells and how they fit with what we sort of already knew about um, T cell populations um, in humans. Um, we've also applied this to looking at uh, mouse myeloid cells. So we um, took eight different um, tissues from mice and looked at all the um, common myeloid cell markers. And then we made this t -SNE universe of the myeloid cell composition, um, in this case in a, in a 2D plot that we could annotate. Um, or you can, if you do this in three dimensions, it's even more interesting and you can see how all these different cell um, populations are more or less related to each other. Um, and then there's some, a lot of things that you can um, sort of take home from this. For instance, macrophages um, being very distinct from each other, while, whereas other um, cell populations um, more continuous between different tissues. Um, and then we can also use this sort of broad perspective of cellular composition to quickly look for differences in a, in a genetically perturbed mouse. So in this case, we had this GMCSF receptor knockout mouse, and then we compare the composition of wild type versus knockout mice. Uh, we can quickly identify things that we'd expect to see, such as um, the alveolar macrophages being missing from the lungs of these knockout mice. And then we also could look at a few other populations and, and, and validate that there were differences between these mice. So it's a, a quick way of screening for differences across a complex mixture of, of cells. Um, and so we're, we really like this t -SNE method because it's really terrific for identifying cellular populations. Um, but then we're sort of back to this question about how to probe relationships between the markers. So I talked about um, you know, functionality versus phenotypic markers and things like that. And how do we sort of test hypotheses about high dimensional data? And this is by request. I, I stopped talking about this, but Charlene told me that I should, I should include this um, to wake you up. It's been a long been a long week. And so I'm just going to illustrate how this works by talking about basketball. I know it's not very popular around here, but the interesting thing about basketball is that all the players have to play offense and defense. Um, and they don't play offense and defense at the same time. And so a hypothesis, which is not necessarily going to be true, is that um, often your offensive profiles are going to be related to your defensive profile. It's kind of like asking whether the phenotypic profile of a T cell is related to its functional profile. So the analogy here is to look at basketball players and test this hypothesis that offensive and defensive stats are related to each other. Um, and also the basis of this is that there's physicians. So I presume that you know players that play center are going to have a typical profile for offense versus defense. And so I took. Um, players from um, 35 years of basketball statistics. And so for each player, I have a year. So a player year is one point. So we have 10,000 points, and then we have 43 parameters for each player. It's very much like mass cytometry data. And then I categorize this into 25 different offensive statistics, 
you know, scoring, rebounds, assists, um, and 13 different dis defensive statistics. And if you just do two-dimensional PCA on, for each point as a player, you can see actually already that we can start to parse out by different positions. So point guards are different from centers in their overall profile by PCA. And TSNE does even better to segregate different, different types of populations. But we're back to the same problem of trying to understand what these populations represent in an intuitive way. And so what we realized also um, in thinking about trying to do this is that you can quantify how well these dimensionality reduction methods are working using this um, average neighborhood preservation ratio. So if you look at the, at the high dimensional data set and take a given point and ask how many, what, what events near that point are similar or closest by, um, <coughs> then you, 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 when, you, when you reduce the dimensionality, you can ask again and ask how many of those neighbors are still there in the lower dimensional data set. And so in this T cell data that I'll show in a minute, um, we can quantify this and, and show that already at one dimension with TSNE, it's as good as three dimensional PCA. And in two dimensional TSNE, we're up around as well as five dimensional PCA. Um, and so, so that means that using one-dimensional TSNE is already very good. And so the, here what we do is we can boil down all the uh, defensive stats on, into one dimension and plot um, the basketball profiles that way, um, and then compare that to a one-dimensional offensive um, statistics boiled down into one dimension. And you can see with this that it's very easy to see um, that offensive profiles are, are correlate really well, or they, they have this relationship with defensive profiles. So centers have this defensive profile um, and, they, and this particular offensive profile, but there's very few players over here that have this offensive profile um, and that defensive profile. So um, the fact that this is not just a random um, smear of points sort of proves our hypothesis. And then what's nice about this method that we call one sense, and I forgot to mention that this is, oh, I, well, we published this already for, for T cell data, is that you can also directly on the same plot sort of annotate what it means. So in this case, these are the defensive stats that we're going into this analysis. And so up here, for instance, you can see um, defensive rebounds is one of these. And so players that have a lot of defensive rebounds are going to be up here on the defensive axis. Um, whereas down here, you know, you can see that three-point shooters are going to be over here because they have a lot of three-point shots. And so you can see, obviously, that having a lot of defensive rebounds um, means that you're also not really taking that many three-point shots. So anyway, that's enough of the basketball. I'll, I'll stop. But it's fun. <laughs> it can be interesting. Um, so that, that, this was a does. So I, yeah, but anyway. Um, so doing this with T cells again. Um, and so this is, again, so we're sort of thinking about the, the, the paradigm, again, sort of back to the same issue of phenotype versus function that I was talking about before. And again, sort of basing everything on this paper, which has been cited more than 4,000 times, and sort of how we think about human T cell populations is to say, is simply to ask what kind of um, phenotypic profiles are indicative of functional capacities. And based on this, these CD45RA, CCR7 positive cells were shown to not be very functional in terms of the cytokines they produce, whereas these other um, central memory, effector memory, and you know, AMRA cells have um, different functional capacities. And this is sort of the basis of the definitions of these different cell subsets. Um, so to do this more generally, uh, we'll use this one sense plot now um, with all these, with a, a number of different phenotypic markers on one axis. And so where the cell is plotted on this axis is indicative of their differentiation state as defined by cell surface markers. And then on the other axis, we have a number of different functional capacities that we can look at um, in terms of the different cytokines produced. Um, or some other markers that are expressed upon stimulation. And so which mark, how these markers have been segregated is subjective, but it allows us to sort of test this subjective hypothesis about the, hypothesis about the data. And so in this case, you can see this big um, smear of cells um, that all express CD45RA and CCR7. And then you can see that 
they correspondingly don't make very many different cytokines, whereas cells that have a broader range of, of cellular phenotypic profiles um, can express a, a much broader range of, of com and various combinations of, of different um, functional markers. And then you can sort of see, you can look in on populations that have um, the same phenotype, for instance, and then different function, and you can zoom in on all these different populations and try to understand what they are. And the nice thing about this is that you don't have to make a large number of plots to understand what's happening in the data, but, um, you know, the problem is that it's a, it's a quite complicated plot to look at. So another way to use this, which is also interesting, is to sort of use it as a basis for trying to understand your data from a biased perspective. So let's say um, Florent you know, knows that these markers are important for specifying um, these three different types of DC cell subsets. And so he wants to do this auto more or less automatically. So he uses just these markers to specify um, what, uh, what their general subset is, and then put in the rest of the markers in the panel to try to more, to subdivide the cell populations with a finer degree. And then they've, they're using this to compare um, DC subsets across different tissues for, and, and again, with various types of genetic manipulation. So I think this is also an interesting way to use it as a guided way to analyze high dimensional data. Okay, so that's the analysis part, and now I'll just talk about some of the other the, the, the data that we've been collecting. Um, so one thing that we've done is just to um, use the mass cytometer to try to um, catalog human lymphocyte phenotype and function at steady state in humans across a number of different tissues. And so this just is, just came out recently, and so we managed to get tissue from a, a number of different human tissues and several samples of each of these. Um, and this is just a sort of broad um, composition that we saw for each of these tissues. And then, um, but within this analysis, we did two different analysis panels, one that has a large number of trafficking um, receptor markers, as well as um, just pretty much all the relevant phenotypic markers we could get to work well. And then we have another panel that has um, a subset of those, as well as an, a number of um, mostly T-cell oriented cytokines that um, can be probed. And so this is quite a rich data set when we collect both of these panels across all those different tissues. And so we try to just summarize this stuff, um, but the point of this paper is really to put these data out there and let people look at their cells of interest. Uh, one thing that you can see just in terms of CD4 positive T cell function is that um, different, that there's a lot of action in various tissues in terms of different helper subsets of T cells. Um, and compared to blood, which is what uh, we usually look at, um, other tissues can be a lot more interesting in terms of um, these cytokines. And of course, you can look at the, all the possible combinations of each of these cytokines as well. Um, another thing that we were interested in is this resident memory T cell um, fraction. And I've talked a lot with Laura here in Melbourne, Lauren McKay, about this. Um, and you can see that, you know, for these non-lymphoid tissues, uh, there are a large percentage of CD69 positive cells that also express CD103 depending on the tissue. Um, and so we can speculate maybe that some of these other 69 positive cells are different types of resident memory cells um, besides the, um, the ones that live in epithelial surfaces. Um, and just an example of what you can do with this type of data is here, just, just zooming in on CD69 positive cells from the liver, and we're, we're interested in this because of our HPV work as well. Uh, we wanted to see how many different types of CD8 positive T cells there are um, that express CD69. So what kind of resident cells are there in the liver or active, maybe some of these are activated cells. And then what we can do is just take that population and run a TC analysis on that and ask and, and then just see what, how many different cells there are. And so this plot is just colored by the relative intensity of these four different markers. So CD103, CD161, CCR7, and CD45RA. Um, you can see that for the CD103, and again, these are all 69 positive. So these 103, 69 positive cells look like the traditional resident memory cells. We don't know what they're doing in the liver, but that's one. The CD161 pop 
population are most likely mate-like cells. And then we have a population that looks a little bit like naive cells despite expressing C69. And then we can describe this large continuum of effector memory and um, sort of EMRA looking CD8 positive T cells. And within that population, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of various chemokine receptors and other markers. Um, so that is the sort of broad perspective thing. And I, I encourage you to take a look at that data depending on your interest. Um, then I'm just going to talk um, quickly, hopefully, about um, this antigen specificity aspect. Um, and so as you know, there's a T cell receptor recognizes um, peptide in the context of MHC. And so this is, um, we, can, we can use this fact to try to identify antigen specific T cells. And so we're using um, peptide MHC tetramers. And we can make large numbers of these by refolding MHC with this UV cleavable peptide. And then we can do small scale exchanges to make stable class 1 MHC loaded with peptide. And then we can tetramerize and uh, use heavy metal tagged peptide MHC tetramers to stain T cells um, for mass cytometry. And then the reason why we wanted to do this is also because we showed that we can, we can multiplex. Um, and so what we can do is um, for any given peptide MHC, so all of these peptide MHCs have the same peptide, we can make a mixture of, of tetramers. So we can tag them with, in this case, three different metals. So we can have a, if we have 10 metals that we use for this, and we give each peptide MHC flavor uh, a, a, a specific combination of three out of those 10 metals, we can multiplex and look at up to 120 different um, tetramers at the same time in a single sample. Because there's 120 different ways that you can choose three metals from a list of 10. Um, and then the nice thing about this is that we have a large number of channels remaining to phenotypically profile the cells that we identify with the tetramers. And so um, just to sort of reiterate that, we can take a single blood or tissue sample and we stain it simultaneously with a cocktail of tetramers. And we can actually do hundreds of different tetramers at the same time. Um, and then another 20 or 30 markers to profile those cells. And then we have, we can identify the cells that bind with three and only three of those labeled tetramers, and then look at the phenotypes of those, those cells. And so this is quite, um, we thought this would be a good thing to use for cancer because it's very important to understand what, what T cells are targeting in cancer. And recently, um, there's a lot of evidence that T cells targeting mutated antigens are especially important in the context of cancer immunotherapy or checkpoint blockade. So, um, and the nice thing about mutated antigens is that there's a finite number of these candidate antigens that we can screen by this approach. Um, we also think that by being able to screen larger numbers of epitopes, we can look and comparing T cells specific for other types of antigens at the same time. Um, and also, um, this sort of also highlights my interest in trying to understand what, um, how epitope dominance is determined and all the different factors that influence um, T, -cell epi T cell epitope specificity. Um, and so I think that this is, uh, again, why looking at antigen specific T cells aren't important for, for biomarkers in these types of diseases. Um, and then lastly, I think when we screen large numbers of antigens, we can make fewer predictions and assumptions about um, the candidates that we're screening for. Um, so we applied this to this mouse model in collaboration with Bob Schreiber. So this MCA sarcoma cell line um, is responsive to checkpoint blockade. Um, so this grows um, uncontrollably unless you treat mice with anti-CTLA-4, it can be controlled. And from the um, whole exome sequencing, they identified about 80 non-synonymous mutations that are predicted to bind h 2 kb And in their paper, they actually identified um, the two dominant antigens that are are, that are being targeted by T cells in this model. Um, but so together with them, though, we, we, re, we, did, we redid the screen all at once. 
um, across different tissues and also in mice with and without treatment to look for the possibility that other epitopes could be used under some circumstances. Um, but what we did find is just that these two dominant antigens uh, were the only ones that we could detect reliably um, and that the frequencies of these cells are highest in tumor and also the frequencies of these cells um, goes up with the anti-CTLA-4 um, treated mice um, in the tumor, but in the periphery, the frequencies don't seem to change um, in response to treatment. So that was the first thing we noticed. And also, just to show that the tetramer staining um, with these tetramers multiplexed is working quite well. And so it's, uh, the mouse model is, is quite nice to be used with H2K and B. Um, and so at the same time, we could phenotypically profile um, these antigen-specific cells. And across all the different experiments, uh, we could describe these 10 different clusters of CD8-positive T cells specific for either of those antigens um, derived from the tumor of mice with or without checkpoint blockade. And so these are the, this is the sort of universe of CD8-positive T cell phenotypes. Um, and we could describe what these are also in terms of individual markers and come up with gating strategies to more or less purify each of these um, 10 clusters of cells. Um, and so what we notice is that in untreated mice, so without the anti-CTLA-4, um, there's already a lot of heterogeneity in the tumor infiltrates of T cells specific for the same two, for these two antigens. So for the LAMA-4 specific cells, um, although we could segregate them further, there's really two major clusters of cells. And then in the ALG-8, we see at least three different clusters. Um, and the, this difference in terms of the composition of LAMA-4 versus ALG-8 specific cells um, was consistent across different experiments. So it shows that um, the, the, the CD8 positive T cells specific for a single antigen are very heterogeneous, and then it is also dictated by the antigen in that um, the other epitope um, was given different composition. And then... After treatment, we, we see a dramatic change in the phenotypes of these infiltrates. So now um, they're no longer in these clusters, and the, and the differences between the epitopes are, are no longer as spectacular. And we can show that this is really caused by reduction in various um, exhaustion-associated markers like PD-1 and TIM-3. Um, and that's sort of quantified, we quantified that here. So we see in the tumor, there's a, there's a major change in the phenotypic profiles of these tumor-specific cells. Um, the other interesting thing is that in the periphery, the treatment had very little effect on the phenotypes of these two antigen-specific T cell populations. Um, and so we sort of conclude that the effects of this are, are specific to tumor infiltrates. And also from this plot, it's interesting to note that um, there's a lot of other populations of cells that are tetramer negative and influenced in, in varying degrees by the anti-CTLA-4 treatment as well. Um, so that's the summary of that part. I'm just going to have to uh, have one more, one, more, one more part that I'll go through. Um, so this is doing the same thing, but now looking at blood samples from chronic HPV-infected uh, patients. Um, and so this is important in Asia, as you probably are aware, because there's a lot of um, chronic HPV, and what we need are better ways of predicting outcome. Um, and so what we did at first is to sort of assemble this cross-sectional cohort of patients, and we put them into these um, four different categories. So immune tolerant are, are patients that have high viral load but low liver inflammation. Immune active mean they have high viral load but also high ALT, which is indicative of liver inflammation. And then we have inactive carriers that have low viral load and low um, ALT, and they also have um, cleared their E antigen, so they have anti-E antibodies. And then we have resolved patients that had been previously acutely infected. And so we wanted to compare HPV-specific T cells across these four different um, patient cohorts. And so similarly to what we've done with the um, to the cancer, we first come up with candidate antigens. And so we, we took a, cohort, a, a, a separate cohort of chronic HPV patients, and we did deep sequencing of viral isolates to identify the, a broad range of, of um, variants for 
of, of viruses, and then we predict HLA binding across all those different variants. We want to try not to miss some common variants of um, viral sequences. And so for this, we actually had 480, more than 480 different candidate HPV epitopes. And then we also included another 78 control epitopes like flu, EBV, CMV, and other various an antigens. And so we have this um, more than 500 different tetramers that we use this multiplexing for to stain each of those patient blood samples. And then for the markers, um, we also put focus on these co-inhibitory receptors that are associated with um, T cell dysfunction and chronic infection. And so from this, uh, you know, with HPV, the, the frequencies of T cell responses are, are, are very low. Um, nonetheless, we were able to detect a few hits um, at a reasonable frequency, um, a, a larger number of hits at very, very low frequency. Um, so we're focused on these, on these more common, higher frequency hits. Um, a couple from the polymerase um, protein and a couple from the core protein. And so what you can see is just that um, actually the frequencies of these cells for um, the one that sort of fits with what had been previously shown is this anti, uh, this core epitope, um, and and what you see uh, consistent with what had been previously reported is that there's a higher frequency of these cells in people that have um, lower viral load or have cleared acute infection, whereas people with high viral load, the immune tolerance, have very very low frequencies of these cells. In contrast, for the other epitopes, we saw not such a good correlation in terms of frequency. And uh, I'll focus your attention on this one. This polymerase epitope was quite variable between um, different people, but we detected it in most of the, of the people that we studied. And within this, um, and then so looking at the phenotypes of these cells, um, we noted that these polymerase-specific T cells were highly heterogeneous between people, and even within the same person, we could see multiple populations of cells in terms of their phenotypic profiles. And and so, um, Young, the guy who was working on this, had sort of designated arbitrarily these seven different clusters of phenotypic profiles based on a TSNI analysis of of antigen-specific cells. And I won't go really through. Um, we're still confused about really what these clusters represent in terms of their phenotype. They don't seem to fit so well to us in terms of classic definitions of, of, of um, different dysfunctional cell subsets. Um, but what's intriguing about it is that we do see relatively consistent differences in the composition in terms of these clusters between the different patient sets. So these immune tolerant um, patient um, had, the, had the highest prevalence of this particular cluster, whereas the other um, sample, patient samples had a more heterogeneous composition. Um, and that's sort of re redrawn here where this cluster six was highest frequency only in immune tolerant, whereas like cluster five is highest in the, in the recovered sample. So we're, so we're trying to use this as a biomarker for try to pr predict what's gonna happen with people and maybe we need actually, we need better um, distinction of what these different patient statuses are. And so I think this is where the analysis of complex clinical data will feed into this and we need to um, try to understand how the, phen the very complicated phenotypic profiles of T cells relates to the very complicated clinical status of these different patients and their possible outcomes. So we think that there's a lot of information in this. We just don't understand it because these, these um, definitions are, are not as accurate as they need to be. Um, I'll skip this part. He also looked at, well, I'll just quickly, he also looked at the function of these cells. So you stimulate this, these HPV-specific cells in culture for about a week and then re-stimulate them again with peptide. You can look at their um, functional capacity. Whoops. And uh, here, using one sense to evaluate the relationship between these exhaustion markers and functional profiles of the cells. In fact, the opposite um, co correlation is what we see in that these uh, otherwise, maybe you could call them activation markers, are associated better with the functional, with functional T cells, whereas cells that don't express many of these markers are dysfunctional in our, in our analysis. And from this, you can also compare the functions of these different HPV-specific cells and how they relate to um, the, the status of infection. <laughs> 
Um, so I think with the HPV stuff, as I mentioned, I think we're, we're trying, to, um, trying to get through this, uh, this very complex data to better understand how T cells are related to um, clinical state in a, in a highly dynamic infection. And so overall, hopefully I, I showed you how um, mass cytometry can be a motivator for new ways of analyzing um, high dimensional single cell data. And I showed the, the basketball analogy. Um, and then I tr try to convince you that this one sense analysis method is useful. And so we did publish this in, uh, in JI recently, so you can take a look at that. And then I, I hope to have shown you sort of about this atlas of T cell phenotype and function um, that, I, that I hope will be useful to look at. Um, and that if you need to um, have any questions about that data, don't hesitate to contact me. And then I tried to show how we're using um, antigen specificity to study cancer and chronic viral infection. And so um, uh, I showed Mike Failing's work, he was the one that was doing the mouse cancer project. Young, who was doing the, the one sense and also the HPV work. Um, and then Mike Wong, who is not on this picture, uh, was doing the, the really broad analysis of, of T cell phenotype and function. And then the rest of these guys have been doing, um, are also contributing in various ways to these projects. Um, so yeah, those, um, the main people I talked about, especially, especially Michael, wasn't pictured before, and then these are our various collaborators in, in Singapore and abroad. So thanks for your attention. That's great. Thanks a lot, Evan. Uh, plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, we'll start with the students. Uh, you're not a student, Sammy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Do we have any student questions first? <laughs> All right, let's go, Sammy. <laughs> yeah. The fundamental principle is still an antibody antigen reaction that can be sometimes right and sometimes wrong. So even though you have a greater number of markers with which you can pinpoint, yeah. where's going to be the end of this? I mean, the frequency of, of 0.004 of an antigen specific cell, how, how confident can you be that this is not a false, false positive? Yeah, obviously at the really low frequencies, it's a lot harder. And that's what makes the HPV work especially hard. I think another thing that we do is we, I mean, we try to, we need to try to, we need to validate these hits by looking at them um, through stimulation, through stimulation assays or whatever it is afterwards. Another thing that we do is that we, with the multiplexing, um, we actually can split the sample and do two different scrambled coatings. So we look for correspondence between the two different coatings, and I didn't get into that. That can help a little bit, but I, I agree. I think it gets really dicey when the frequencies are very low. Um, then we just need more sample and more, um, and then try to look for things that are consistent across different people. Yeah. There might be some diseases where the limiting cell turns out to be a patent for cell or a B cell. You focusing on T cells, do you think you're gonna pick that up or? Uh, well, I think that was, I mean, yeah, I think that's why I sort of we're also just doing this broad profiling type things. I think the problem is that humans are just so variable that if you try to compare um, normal versus disease X, whatever it is, and you look at the composition of blood across every type of cell you can think of with a pretty broad panel, then you're just going to get a lot. It's going to be really difficult to find signal um, in that noise in terms of human heterogeneity. And so I think we have to have some kind of hypothesis in terms of what types of cells should be involved. And that's where the hypothesis that trafficking or activation or whatever could be important. But yeah, I think innate lymphoid cells are on our radar as well. Dan? Hi. Yeah. You had this interesting correlation between activation or exhaustion markers in the HPV infected and, and the cytokines. Like they're making this, so they look like they're affected, so they're, they're doing something. Yeah, remember, so this, I know, we go around in circles about this. I mean, so remember, what we've done is that we stimulated the cells in vitro with peptides for a week. And when cells get stimulated, they, that causes them to induce expression of all these markers. So they're exhaustion markers, but they're also activation markers. They're sort of poised, I suppose. But I wonder if you could draw like an anti-correlation with what you see in the tumor settings. 
It is, but yes, yeah, so that's the confusing thing. I think obviously these markers are associated with dysfunction in LCMV and in tumors um, and, in, and in vivo. So yeah, I know this is, this is interesting. And so I guess I don't understand the in vitro work as well. Um, I have a question. So um, with TSNE compared <coughs> to kind of classical statistical methods, have you, have you made a discovery that you think is a discovery and gone back and asked the question, could that have been um, discovered through classical means without knowing that that was the cell type you wanted to discover in the first place? Mm. Yeah, I guess I maybe uh, haven't, made, question, haven't made, yeah, my yeah. problem is I haven't made very many discoveries, so I have to think hard about what I, what I supposedly discovered. Yeah. yeah, I guess the problem is that you're right. I think now we're just sort of looking at what's there, and I don't know whether it's good in terms of its ability to detect uh, statistically relevant things, but I think it should hopefully give you an idea of you see something that looks peculiar and then you do some stats or something. So would you view it as more of a hypothesis generating yeah. tool yeah. rather than a definitive readout of, well, you can yeah. go and discover something that's worth exploring and then go and test. Yeah, it I think it's a hypothesis generation tool. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm intrigued by like these um, discriminant analysis methods that are like deep learning type methods that are trying to look for things that are different about um, for sets of samples and maybe those will be um, more useful in terms of trying to discover cell populations that are important rather than just trying to understand the composition of, of the tissue. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I have one more. So Lauren, <laughs> La I have lots of questions, but <laughs> Lauren von der Martin is the inventor oh, of yeah. TSNE and I see he's now at Facebook. That's right. Can you tell us about that? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I, I wanted to talk to him about this one sense idea. So I emailed him and it was really cool because I got, I had a Skype call with him and he's a really nice guy. And then, yeah, he, he had. Just, and why Facebook interested him? Oh, because he's in the AI department. Yeah. So he's, I guess, have you heard of this thing called the, the singularity where computers become smarter than humans and take over the world? I think that's what they're doing there. <laughs> So they're using T-SNE on us. So they're using T-SNE on I, us. I presume. Because I, I saw one image of T-SNE where they basically piled in photos from around the web and then they were able to categorize them into boats, but then red boats and blue boats and kind of automatic categorization of photographs. Yeah, I think that's what he was first doing, right? Yeah. When he, yeah. And he, his website is amazing. He's got so many different applications for this. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. All right, well, we might leave it there, but um, there's lunch for the students with, Laura, uh, with Evan, not Laura, <laughs> um, now in the boardroom. But let's thank Evan for an excellent talk. Right, thanks.